Hello, Seven Church family. My name is Gian and I'm a volunteer. I would like to thank you for visiting us online. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are and what we do as a church, you can visit our website. That's www.7sdchurch.com. If you would like to support our ministry financially, one easy way to do that is to text the amount to 7SD at mogiv.com. We're currently in our series called Crazy Makers. In this series, you will learn how to biblically deal with people that drive you crazy. Thank you and enjoy the service. Hi, my name is Ed Kimsey. I'm one of the board members here of the church. I just wanted to... Um, uh, tell you just a few things I thought you guys should know about. Um, one of the things the uh, board has voted this year, as we've done in the previous years, is we want to take a, uh, a love offering for our pastor and the staff um, at this time of the year. So if you guys do, uh, if you guys want to contribute to that, you can just mark it on your envelopes and we'll make sure that it does, the funds do uh, get sent to the, uh, the pastor and the staff to kind of thank them for what they do for us. Uh, the other announcement I want to share with you is um, I, think, I think we all know how busy Jeremy's been with uh, the church merger everything that, you know, the, with all the improvements with the campus, and then just being our pastor every week. But one of the things he's been working on uh, these past few years is his PhD. And this Thursday and Friday, he will be graduating with his doctorate in ministry. So I'm a couple days early, but I just want to uh, introduce to you Dr. Jeremy McGarity. Oh, thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. I'm very glad to be done with that process, uh, but I appreciate your support and prayers uh, during that process as it was long and arduous, but very good. I love learning. And I do, as Ed mentioned, I do graduate on, uh, the, there's a baccalaureate on Thursday, then on Friday there's uh, the actual ceremonies. If you want to watch, you can actually watch it live online, and it's biola.edu, B-I-O-L-A, Bible Institute of Los Angeles, um, and it's online. You can, you can see me go, ah, or whatever. <laughs> whatever I decide to do in that moment that finally came. All right. Hey, let's jump into the Word, huh? This is going to be fun. First, I want to let you know this invite card is so that you can hand it out to someone in your oikos, someone in your 8 to 15 that doesn't normally go to church or doesn't have a church home, or you just want to invite somebody to get a great message and a great night this uh, Christmas Eve Eve, Friday, December 23rd at 7 p.m. And then Christmas Eve, we'll have two services, 5 and 7 p.m. And, you know, this is one of the times where people are most likely to come to church, Christmas Eve. Maybe you've been praying you got your Oikos list. You've been praying and praying and praying for people to come. Um, Christmas Eve is one of those times where they'll finally say yes if they've said no to everything else. All your bribes and lunch offers and everything else. They'll say yes to Christmas Eve, oftentimes. And so uh, I would love for you to make sure you're inviting people. Hand these out to people. You'll see our sign out there. The number one thing we want them to know is that they matter to God and they matter to us. Okay? They matter to God and they matter to us. That's why we put it on the sign out there. So that will be fantastic. And as a matter of fact, to help you out, I want to show you a little video that will teach you a little something about inviting someone to Christmas Eve services. Take a look at this video. I'll be inside in a minute. I'm going to say hey to Joe. Hey, Joe. Hey, Mike. Flower beds are looking good, neighbor. Yep. You guys should get back from church. Ah. Yeah, yeah, I just been at the church house. I wonder why he never invites me to church. I mean, I'd go if he asked me to go. But this is the way it is. I'm out in my front yard when he comes home from church. It's always so awkward. It's so awkward. And I'm so hungry. Ugh. I think my wife made goulash. I love goulash. Oh! Maybe Joe would like some goulash for lunch. Hey, Joe. Here comes the invitation to church. Yeah? You want to come over for sure, a Sure, I'd goulash? love to go to church with you. What'd you just say? What'd you just say? No, what? No, what'd you say? What'd no, you what say? you say? You said something about God. God, God. Goo. 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 Goulash. Goulash? Goulash. It's a... 
You're having goulash at your church? No, no, at my house. You're having, you're inviting me over for goulash? Yeah. At your, goulash? Yeah, who doesn't like goulash? I'd like some goulash. Yeah, sign me up, goulash. I'll check and make sure we have enough. I see you walking away. <laughs> promise me you will not be awkward when you invite someone to church, okay? Pinky promises, every pinky's out. We're not going to be awkward when we invite someone to church. <laughs> Hand them one of these, invite them to church. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic, fantastic time. Now, next Sunday, next Sunday, this is very important. This is a big Sunday at our church next Sunday. It's going to be Ugly Sweater Sunday. Who has an ugly sweater? Good. Get one if you don't have one. And uh, some of you are wearing them today. <laughs> no. Sorry, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But, uh, um, hey, next time we'll have some fun with it. Get an ugly sweater. Everybody be wearing ugly sweaters, all right? The church, we're going to have a good time with that. That's going to be a fun time. Friday, Friday night, movie night, right out here. Community movie night. We're going to be showing The Grinch, and it's going to be just a blast, okay? Lots of fun, festivity stuff, the community. We wanted the community here. Last one was a huge success, and it'll be a huge success Again, so invite, invite, invite. A great way uh, to have people come. Now, January 1st, we are having services January 1st, okay? Just remember, January 1st, but we are not having an 8 a.m. service, okay? So uh, that doesn't matter to you because you're like, I don't come to 8 a.m. anyway. So uh, 9.30 and 11 we will have, but no 8 a.m. service. And on January 1st, we will be baptizing. What a great day. January 1st of a new year, what a great day to get baptized. All right, awesome. Some of you'll need to wash off the night before. It'll be perfect for you. All right, if we're just being honest, we'll keep the music down and we'll make sure. No, I'm just kidding. But we will. All right, it's going to be a fun time. We're going to have a good time, and I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to be baptized first of the year. What a great way to start off the new year. Let us know if you're interested in that. Just mark it on your connection card. Today, we continue in our Crazy Maker series, and we're going to be talking about how do you handle critical people. Anybody have critical people in their life? Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Critical people. Okay, now, are they sitting? How many of you would say they're sitting next to me? No, just get ah, no, no. <laughs> no, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, remember, we don't want fights during the series. This is going to be a fun series. All right, and uh, we're learning, though. We're talking about this whole idea. How do we handle critical people? Because criticism is unavoidable. It's absolutely unavoidable. You will be criticized in life. There's no getting around it. So we have to understand that, that we're going to be criticized. You'll be criticized. I'll be criticized. We'll all be criticized. Matter of fact, let's say it together. One, two, three. I will be criticized. Ready? One, two, three. I will be criticized. So once we recognize that and we know that's going to happen, uh, we can deal with it. We need some tools to help us deal with Critical people, and how do we do that? How do we go about doing that? And I want to make sure I help you understand clearly, biblically, how we deal with it. Okay? But it's a very normal thing, criticism. All through the Bible, you see it. You go to the Old Testament, Moses was criticized because he married a Cushite woman. Okay? He married someone, and his family wasn't okay with it. Anybody here ever marry someone, and their family wasn't okay with it? <laughs> yeah, right? You're part of the Moses Club, okay? I mean, that's just something that people just, they criticize, right? In the New Testament, you have the Apostle Paul, incredible world changer, wrote most of the New Testament, constantly criticized. They're criticized for being a hypocrite. They called him a hypocrite. They called him a liar. They called him a bad teacher. All these things constantly criticized. But the greatest example of all is Jesus. Jesus was criticized. Here's perfection. On the earth, never sinned, walks the earth in perfection, and yet he was criticized. So if the perfect one was criticized, <laughs> we can be sure in our imperfection, we will be criticized as well. All right, praise and criticism say a lot about a person. Praise and criticism reveals what we value most. If we praise something, it reveals that we value that. If we criticize something, oftentimes it's showing our insecurities. 
It just reveals something about us. Now, why is it that people are so critical? Well, the truth is most of the time, those who are most critical are the ones who really don't like themselves. That's often the case. People that are the most critical about everything, they actually don't like themselves very much. And they'll criticize you because it helps validate them. When people are criticizing you, a lot of the time it's just because they feel so bad. They need to try and bring people down so that they'll feel a little bit better. So they'll feel above you. But they're actually very insecure people. They're actually hurting uh, inside. So how do we deal with it? Many of you, for every, every single day, this is a real issue. For some of you, you grew up with parents that were very critical. And you deal with that. They were so critical, maybe you hit a home run in Little League. And you came out expecting your dad to be happy. And your dad said, well, that barely cleared the fence. Jeez, the good thing the wind was blowing out. You know? It's like that kind of an attitude. And you kind of gone, man, you know, I can never please. I just can never please. Maybe some of you are in a marriage where the conversation is characterized by criticism, constant criticism. And there's just this negativity. You're never good enough. And on and on and on. And unfortunately, Christians, among all people, Christians can be the most critical of other Christians. And that hurts. And so maybe that's something you're dealing with. So how do we deal with it? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, real quick, I'm going to give you two wrong responses And then I'm going to give you three right responses, okay? Two wrongs and three rights. Number one, when you're criticized, here's a wrong response, okay? Just don't fight. Do not fight. In other words, don't fight criticism with criticism. Proverbs 26.4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. When someone criticizes us, don't we want to fight back? I mean, the human nature in us, there's something that wells up. And we start thinking of the negative things that they've done, you know. We, we start going, I want to fight back. And I'm, oh, yeah, well, you're, you're an idiot, you know. You're di-. And it's like, it's like this criticism. They gave us some criticism. We just want to fight right back. And the Bible says, don't do that. Don't answer a fool in their folly. Someone's criticizing you. It doesn't help to criticize someone back. But we want to fight. Secondly, do not flight. I put fight or flight. Don't run is what I'm saying. Don't run and hide. Now, you look at Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, and they look contradictory if you look at them on the surface. This is why it's really important to understand context. You look at 26, 4, it says, Don't answer a fool according to his folly. You yourself be like him. 26, 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly. Or they'll be wise in their own eyes. If you just look at that verse on the surface, those two verses, you go, hey, that's contradictory. Why are they right next to each other? What am I supposed to do? Great question. You've got to use common sense. All right? When you look at it from a surface level, there's situations where you need to answer a fool. All right? You've got to answer them. There's other situations where you just let it be. What is he saying here? Solomon, the wisest man of all time, is saying, use common sense. If someone's inebriated, someone's had too much to drink, and some of you might experience this around the Christmas table, you got family members, they start to get their beer courage, and you know what happens, right? They start popping off, and they start saying things, and they start making you feel bad. They're criticizing you. They're just getting more and more courage as, as time goes on. And you're going to have a tendency, and you're going to have a desire to fight back. You're going to want to answer a fool in their folly. And he says, don't do it. Have some common sense. They're not going to receive it. As a matter of fact, they're baiting you. They just want you to be pulled in again so you can be just like them. You know the saying when you wrestle a a pig in the mud, right? Two people get dirty, but only one enjoys it. Or two get dirty, and only one enjoys it, right? The pig. And that's what's happening. They're trying to pull you into this this mess, this muddy mess, and they're going to love it. They mud all over them. And you're going to sit there and look like a fool. He says, don't do it. Okay, so... Don't criticize them back. Don't jump in uh, to that fray. But there are times to answer them. There are times. Let's say the person is of sober mind, and they're saying something negatively about you. They're saying something about your faith. That's when, and we talked about this a little bit last week, that's when he says, answer a fool according to their folly. Or they'll be right in their own eyes. They something, say something blatantly wrong against Jesus or your faith. It's time to say something. With gentleness and respect, the Bible says. You don't jump in and say, oh, yeah, well, you're going to hell. You know, that doesn't help. (laughs) You say, hey, here's here's actually what that is. 
Let me, let me help you with it. Let me, let me help you understand this. Here's, here's why I believe what I believe. Because what you're saying, that's not what the Bible says. You need to understand that, okay? Or whatever it might be. You answer a person when there's clearly something missing. Does that make sense? Not if that makes sense. Okay, good. That's important to understand because some of you are going to deal with that. You're going to have a chance to practice this stuff in a week or so. All right, so just get this stuff down, and I'll explain more on how to do that specifically. Obviously, there's many wrong responses. Anger is a wrong response. Frustration is a wrong response. Fighting physically is a wrong response. But I want to focus on the right responses, okay? I'm going to give you three. Three right responses when you're criticized. All right, let's take a look. First thing we're going to do is listen to constructive criticism. I want to listen to constructive criticism. Now, you don't know sometimes, is this constructive or is this hurtful? This is what you need to know. Are they trying to help me or hurt me? That's how I know whether I need to listen to this or not. Are they trying to help me or are they trying to hurt me? Let's say you're trying to lose weight. And, and, and someone comes up, you know, the, and instead of being helpful, they say, hey, have you tried skim milk? You're looking a little bit chubby. All right. That's not, that doesn't help, right? But let's say someone says, hey, man, 24-hour fitness is doing a, a two-for-one deal, the gym membership. I want to get in better shape, and I just want to know if you wanted the freebie, and we can go together. We can go together. That's probably someone that cares about you. That's probably someone that's trying to help. And that might be someone that I listen to. Because they're trying to help. They're not trying to hurt. So write this down. Listen when the person can help you. If you're taking notes, man, they're, they're, these are people that are knowledgeable. They have some experience in the area. They're very wise. Then you need to listen to them. Listen to that constructive criticism. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Proverbs 15, if you listen to constructive criticism, you will be at home among the who? Wise, yes, yes, yes. If you reject this kind of criticism, the Bible says, read it with me, you only harm yourself. So when it's constructive and they're trying to help, very important to listen. Don't get offended. Don't put up walls. Don't, don't give them the Heisman, right? And push, push them away. It's like, I need to listen to what, what they're saying. And I, I want to argue this, that people are not reaching their full potential. Okay, they're not reaching their full potential because they're so easily offended when someone's trying to help them. Someone's trying to help them be better. Someone's trying to help them reach another level. And they get offended because someone's trying to bring in constructive criticism. Let me say this. Whether you're in the room, you're watching online, one of our home campuses, or anywhere around the world, I want to say this. Young people, all right, if you're, you're a teenager, we had a lot of young people in our church. You're a teenager or you're a young 20s. You need to learn now to take constructive criticism. There's something with the generation now that everyone's offended. You know, young people get offended when you're trying to bring correction. And don't get offended. Receive the constructive criticism. It's only going to make you better. You're going to rise to new heights by listening to people that are trying to help you. It's really important to understand that. In our culture here at Seven, it's a big part of what we do. Constructive criticism. Every Tuesday we have a staff meeting. We sit down and the first couple things we ask. What went well? What do we need to do better at in every department, in every area? What needs to improve? Nobody sits there when everyone starts to, you know, give information and say, you know what, this was off, this person was missing, so that fell. What, what do we need to do? No one goes, well, why are you getting on me? No one gets offended. It's part of our culture to get better. And it's getting better. We've got a long way to go. We're still improving, and we're constantly tweaking stuff. We're constantly saying, well, what about this? What about that? Hey, we need to improve this area. How can we be better at doing this? And it's our culture, and everybody understands we're all in the same boat. We're all rowing in the same direction. And so let's just keep getting better. Let's keep getting more effective. Let's keep reaching more people. And you need to do that. You need to do that wherever you are. Let me give you some really, really good advice that will absolutely make you successful in life. Go to your boss. Many of you have bosses. Go to your boss before the end of the year. Ask for a meeting with your boss and say this to your boss. Hey, I want to improve as an employee. I want to help this company. How can I do better at my job? How can I help this company more? Is there anything I'm doing that you would like to see me do differently? Wow. You will rise to a different level above all the other employees 
Because right, because you're asking, how do I improve? Because today, for some reason, a lot of bosses are nervous about saying or bringing correction to employees because of these crazy litigation laws and these crazy HR people and all this stuff. And so a lot of times bosses won't say what needs to change. Right? So it's awesome if you would go to them and say to him or to her, how do I get better? How, how do I make, how, how am I more, do you see anything in me or, or how my work is that I can improve on that would really help this company? Wow. I'll tell you what, you're going to go to a whole other level in that company, at least in their mind. If not, when the next promotion comes up, that'll be, they'll be thinking about you. Why? Because you, you admit you don't have it all figured out. Because you admit you want to be better. You admit you want to help the company. And by doing that, man, you just, you'll make a huge difference. You're asking for constructive criticism. I'm telling you, that will make a huge difference in your life. You need people in your life that you allow them to say, here's what I think you can do better. Here's an area I think you're, you're, you have a blind spot here. I want to help you get better. I'm telling you guys, that will make a big difference. In order for you to be all God's called you to be, all right, take constructive criticism. Very important. Secondly, write this down. There's a time to answer when you're criticized. Someone criticizes you, there is a time to answer. When? Well, a couple of practical thoughts. You might write this down. I didn't put a place for it in your notes. But if they're missing information, okay, they're missing information. They're criticizing you, but they don't have the backstory. They're criticizing you, but they don't realize something that's gone on in your life. That's when you can say, you listen. First, you don't jump in and cut their criticism off. Don't go, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait, wait, you don't have any idea. You don't jump, don't, don't cut them off. Let them, let them finish and say, okay, I understand what you're saying. But what I want to let you know about is, and you very calmly explain to them the missing information. You give them the missing info. Right? You're getting criticized, but that they weren't, they didn't have all the information. So, Write this down. You answer when the person is open to change. Answer when the person is open to change. There certainly are people that are going to be critical no matter what. Okay, this is where you need the discernment from the Lord. There are certain people, they're not open to receiving anything from you, any kind of uh, uh, answer to anything. And you need to know these kinds of people. And we'll talk about those in a moment. Right, you don't try to answer them. Now let's stop for a minute and talk about marriages because some of you are in marriages that are characterized by critical words. The only thing I can say to you is if you don't stop, you will never have the marriage God intends you to have. If you're nitpicking each other, always tearing each other down, you will never have the kind of intimate, important, fulfilling marriage that God has called you to have. You cannot keep tearing each other down and think you're going to have a positive marriage. It's really important. You have to decide you're going to focus on the good. Every single day in marriages, you have a choice. I'm going to focus on the bad or I'm going to focus on the good. I'm going to focus on the positive or I'm going to focus on the nitpicking and the negative. Now, there are times you need to sit down and say, hey, how, how do we make our marriage better? All right? How do we make it better? Let's, let's talk about some ways we can make it better. Right? That's important. Great marriages are often just people who decided to focus on the good. Another side point, don't go home and say, see, you're being that kind of person Pastor Jeremy's talking about. <laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> Make sure you don't do that. All right, but let's look at Scripture. In the Old Testament, we see a person answering critical people. Judges, chapter 8, great chapter. You ought to read Judges. Judges is a great, a great book. It talks about Gideon. All right? But there's a group of people that were criticizing Gideon, he'd won some battles, an amazing story, God had really touched him, worked through him, and this group called the Ephraimites criticized Gideon sharply, it says. They criticized him sharply. Instead of Gideon standing up and saying, I'm a warrior and I'll take you down too, you criticize me, who do you think I, I'm God's chosen instrument to da da da, he goes, he starts encouraging the Ephraimites. He says, oh man, you guys are talking about me, but listen, you've done way more than me. 
He said, you guys have conquered way more battles. You guys have taken down enemies. You guys are amazing. And look what it says. After he gives them encouragement, look at the result. When they heard this, they calmed down and what? Cooled off. Yeah, oftentimes people are criticizing you because they're just fired up. They're angry about something. But man, your words, your words, how you reply make all the difference in calming a situation, cooling people off. You'll either, I always think of it this way, when criticism, you have two buckets, right? One's full of water, one's full of gasoline. When a fire of criticism comes up, you either pour water on it or you pour the gas <laughs> and it blows up into a, a humongous mess. There is a time when someone cares, when, when they can help to listen to constructive criticism. There's a time when someone's criticizing you to give them a piece of information if they're open to it. But number three, this is really important. You need to learn to dismiss invalid criticism. It's not valid. Okay? It goes back to answering a fool in his folly. They're just spewing off their own pain. They're just, you're just the closest target. So they're just, they got a lot of hurt inside them, and they're just blah, 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 and it's just focused on you in that moment. You just need to, pff, you know better than that. Just dismiss that. When, well, A, I put in your notes there, when people are overly critical. These are the people that are always negative. I mean, they are always negative, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, the, the Chargers could win, but yeah, but Philip Rivers only threw for 200 yards. You know, he's going downhill. You know, and it, it, I mean, it, it, it's 70 degrees out. It's a little chilly. Can you believe it? You know, I mean, it's just constant negative, negative, right? I mean, they'd have a problem with a unicorn farting. I mean, it's like you don't even know it farts a rainbow. And they're like, did you see that? I mean, it's terrible, all right? It's just they always negative, 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 negative. And it's like those people, you just dismiss that. I don't know where that came from. I really don't know. A unicorn. <laughs> I, I had, that's not in my notes. You can pray for me on that one. Okay, but that's, all right, they're just negative. That's the point. They're just negative people. You just need to dismiss that, all right? You just dismiss that invalid criticism. And then secondly, you dismiss them when they're emotionally unhealthy, right? They're wounded people. They're just wounded people. And, and they're coming at you because they're wounded. And you know the saying, we said it a lot, hurting people hurt people. <laughs> hurting people hurt people. When they're hurting, often, man, they're just letting it out. And it's just, you're right there. So they're just dumping it on you. You have to know, you know what, that's not about me. <laughs> that person is, is hurting. They got a lot of stuff going on. Maybe they're going through something, you know. Maybe they're hurting financially. Maybe their body is changing and their hormones are freaking out. And I, you don't know, right? You're just going, man, you're just an easy target. Jesus had to do this all the time. A great example in Scripture. He told this story about the Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees were the religious people of the day. They had the Bible all wrong, but they thought they had it right. So they were trying to put laws and rules on people that... Jesus never meant for people to carry. So Jesus gets on them. Jesus let them have it. And the disciples came to Jesus because in their minds, they still had the religious people. They'd grown up. But these religious people are kind of high society. And they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, you know, you offended those guys. You offended the religious leaders. You know that? Look what Jesus says. He replied, every plant not planted by my heavenly Father will be rooted up. So read it with me. Ignore them. All right, let's say it again. So ignore them. Dismiss it. He said they are blind guides leading the blind. They will both fall into a ditch. What is he saying? Those words aren't from God. When people are overly critical, when they're hurt emotionally and they're coming at you with some critical words, understand some people, they think, oh, is that God trying to straighten me up? That's not from God. It's not from God. This is just a hurting individual. This is just a person that's got some bitterness or some pain, and it's just coming out in the wrong time, and in the wrong way, okay? And let me say this. As you become more effective at whatever you do, you become more effective at work, you become more effective, whatever you do, in ministry, whatever it is, the more effective you become, the more you're a target for criticism. You just need to know that, all right? You just, as you're getting better and better, you just need to know you're more of a target for criticism, and you can get easily distracted trying to fix every criticism instead of doing what God's called you to do. 
and staying on track. All right? If it's invalid, we just move on, we brush it off. Let me explain it this way. Several years ago, I was in a ministry and 12,000 people in the church and I was speaking seven services a weekend. That's a lot. And I was doing that pretty consistently and I was getting worn out, burned out, tired, just exhausted, hard to, hard to re-energize. And one particular weekend, I was done. I was toast. I was just at that level, you know, where you're just like, if someone else could just speak, that would be so fantastic, you know, because I'm just exhausted. And I'm getting ready to speak, and someone slips me a, 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 a a little card, a little, little note, you know, envelope, the whole thing. Just comes right through here. And this happens, you know, because people on our staff up there, they would hand us little notes to say something up front, like, hey, this is what's going on. Don't forget to mention this. So that was, an un- we'd, never look, we'd never look around like, who's, and so I just grab it. I just grab the note. And so um, as I'm thinking about this, we got a couple more songs that are playing, and I'm like, oh, you know, because I was so discouraged. I'm like, thank you, Lord. Someone slipped me a note to encourage me before I go up to speak this weekend. That's so sweet. So nice, you know. So I'm just going to read it right now. So I open it up, and I mean, big mistake. Big mistake. Someone's just absolutely ripped into me. You're a complete loser. You're a jerk. You're this. I mean, just, just the, I mean, words that I can't even repeat. Uh, it was just unbelievable. I'm just like, what? did I do to this person? You know, I'll stop saying about Raider fans. Okay, you know, it's like whatever. And so I was just like, man, I couldn't believe. And in that moment, I had a choice. In that moment, I had a choice. I could have got really angry and bitter and just, you know, um, or even quit, run, just said, oh, really, this is how you're going to treat me? And you know what, though, in that moment, I realized whoever would take the time to write something like that, um, it's got to be hurting pretty bad. And I just happen to be the guy on stage that's the target because there is no justification for that whatsoever. And so I can just write that off. Now, if they had given their name, um, I, I would have hunted them down and killed them. No, I, if they would have <laughs> given their name, you knew that was good. If, I had give, if they had given their name, I would have tried to make it right. I would have called to meet with them. I would have, hey, what's going on? How, what did I do? Did I say something? You know, I certainly didn't mean to offend you. Uh, I would have comp- had a meeting with them, but there was no name. There was no nothing, okay, which is very weak sauce, okay? Uh, if you're going to criticize someone, be man or woman enough, put your name, name to it, by the way, if you, okay, if you, if you ever do that. Um, but here's the thing. At our church, like, we, we love constructive criticism, because everybody's eyes are different, right, in terms of what they see. Something's off. Something's not right. Somebody's doing something. This isn't good. Hey, we love to receive that. We want to make it better. We don't think we have all the answers, all right? Our staff, we don't. We miss things, but we're trying to improve, as I mentioned. So if you see something that we can improve on, man, write it down. Hey, write it down, you know? Stop showing horror movies in the kids' ministry. Something like that, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I didn't know they were showing horror movies. No, no, that's not happening, but... Just give us, give us that idea, write your name on it so we can really understand, you know, what's going on. But I, I, our whole staff knows this. Like, if you write something derogatory, and thank goodness you guys are awesome, that doesn't happen. But if that ever happens, we're, I've instructed the staff, if someone writes something negative, and they don't put their name on it or any kind of contact information, we don't read it. Anonymous, don't go to church here, okay? We don't read it. If you put your name on it, we read every, every single bit of it. When we might contact you, say, hey, how do we get better? What do we do? What happened? You didn't like the unicorn thing? Sorry, you know, did I offend you? All right, we'll talk about it. We'll say, we'll get better at this. We want to make sure we don't blow this, okay? Um, and so that's really important to understand. And if you want to criticize someone, you have a criticism, constructive criticism, put your name on it. Say, hey, I think you can get better at this, all right? That's important to understand because here's what happened. We can start chasing the approval of people. We can start chasing people's approval. Oh, man, what are they thinking of me now? Oh, they don't like me. Oh, no. And guess what happens? It completely throws us off focus of what God wants you to do. You can chase the approval of people, and that, that's a problem. Okay, you don't want to get into that. But you know what? If we can say, God, if you're pleased with me, I'm okay. I'm going to keep going. That's it. That day I got up on stage, and that's what I said in my heart. God, if you're pleased with me, that's all that matters. May this impact people. I'm not even going to think about that letter anymore. Just... Let me move forward. If you're pleased with me, I'm good to go. 
You got to learn to dismiss invalid criticism. Some of you, as I mentioned, you're going to have a chance to practice it on Christmas. You get around those family members that you know, you're thinking, they always criticize me. They're always on my case, and I don't know why. You just need to learn to dismiss that. All right, some of you are dreading Christmas because of that. All right, so just dismiss some of that invalid criticism. All right, and let me, let me say this too. I want to talk to those of you who are watching online or in the building who are critical people. You would, you would say, uh, if you're honest, you would say, man, my demeanor and my, the way I use my words is constantly critical. I want to help you understand, you will never change someone by being critical. If you're constantly on your kids in a critical sense, if you're constantly on your spouse in a critical sense because you think, man, they're finally going to get it, all you're doing is pushing them away. All you're doing is pushing them away. Okay, so don't, don't keep doing that. Matter of fact, what I've prayed for you this week is that when you come with those critical words, that the Holy Spirit would convict your heart, that the Holy Spirit would convict you, and you'd catch those words, and you'd recognize, man, I'm that critical person. And the Holy Spirit would convict you, and you'd stop doing that. If you look for the bad, you'll find it every single time. You look for the good, you're going to find it. Every single time. Look for the good. Dealing with critical people is part of life. I'm going to be criticized. You're criticized, right? We cannot please all the people, but we can please God. And that's what matters. Pleasing God. I'll tell you this last story, and then I'll let you get out of here. This, uh, when I played with the St. Louis Cardinals and I was in the minor leagues, we had a farm director. They called the minor league system the farm. And we had a farm director, the farm leagues. You know, you probably heard that term. And our minor league farm director was really looked up to by everyone because he held their baseball career in his hand, okay? His decision, it was his decision whether we moved up a level, whether we got to the big leagues or not, based off his evaluation. He's the farm director, First part of my career with the Cardinals, it was a guy named Mike Jorgensen. Later, Ted Simmons was his name. But Mike Jorgensen was like a god to these baseball players and to me as a non-believer at the time. And I remember the first time I had this experience, the, the, the management sat me down and said, Jorgie's coming to town. We called him Jorgie, Mike Jorgensen. Jorgie's coming. McGarrity, you're pitching. Don't blow it. Don't blow it. You need, to, you need to show them what you got. You need to make sure you're on top of your game. And all these words, right? It's like, let me just play the game, man. You're putting more pressure on me. But they're like, Jorgie's coming, Jorgie's coming. There's a big thing. And so I would go out and try to perform for Jorgie. I became a believer. And this verse was the first verse that really stuck with me. Colossians 3.23. I learned it in a different um, translation, but I like this translation here, Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as for working for the Lord, not human masters. When I saw that, that was so freeing and so relieving. I was like, I'm going to go out, I'm going to do my best, not because Georgie's watching, I'm going to go out and do my best because Jesus is watching, and I want to do the very best I can for him. I'm going to give it everything I got, leave the results to him. But I'm going to go out 110%, not because Georgie might promote me or demote me, but because God's there. That changed my whole perspective. I'm no longer working for human masters. I'm working for Jesus. And 1 Thessalonians reminds us, look at it there. For we speak as messengers who have been approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is what? Let's read this together. Our purpose is to please God, not people. So we're not going to be driven by what other people think. We're not going to be driven by their criticism. If it's constructive, I'm going to listen. I want to get better. But if it's overly critical, if it's from hurting people, I'm not going to pay any attention to it. You can't control what they say this Christmas, but you can control how you react. And your reaction might be the difference between them being attracted to your faith or to them pushing it away a little farther. It's a great witness 
be able to have a great reaction. At the end of the day, when we lay our head down on our pillows, hopefully we're able to say, God, I just wanted to be able to please you today. You were my number one focus. So that one day we'll hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. God, thank you. We trust you. We're thankful for you. Thankful for what you're doing. Thankful for who you are. Thankful that this Christmas season, we're able to focus on you for a few moments even. And for people that don't normally focus on you, they're going to they're gonna be impacted by your word this Christmas. We look forward to that, God. Thank you so much. For some of you, you're thinking of that, that uh, Christmas dinner. You're thinking of that Christmas gathering and get-together. And Would you just say to the Lord right now, in your heart, he can hear you, say, Lord, help me to react differently this year. Help me to react in such a way that it's a powerful witness for you. God, renew our minds, change our hearts to be driven for your glory and not the approval and opinions of other people. We recognize we're living this life and it's really for an audience of one. We thank you for that, Lord. We give you the praise and it really wouldn't kill anyone to give the Chargers a W today. In Jesus' name, amen. Huh? All right, put them together.